Good dear all, welcome to the session 2 of the module 1. So now we will see the classification of these fuels. Fuels are classified according to their existence, then uh, natural fuels are artificial fuels. So natural fuels exist in the original form such as wood, fatty oils, etc. The other form of fuels in is artificial or manufactured fuels. They are distillation products such as coal gas, water gas and alcohols and also prepared fuels such as coke, benzene, hydrogen gas etc. So that means uh, uh, these are distillation products such as coal gas, water gas and alcohols. So these are prepared after distillation mm -hmm. and uh, prepared gases such as coal, benzene, hydrogen, these are prepared intentionally and they were about these coal gas, water gas and alcohols they are uh, byproducts. Say for example alcohol, ethanol is a ethyl alcohol, it is a byproduct so obtained in the manufacture of uh, sugar. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the other hand is coke, benzene, hydrogen, these are intentionally or purposely prepared as a fuel. Even though these two comes under the category of artificial uh, manufactured fuels, first category is uh, they are byproducts. For the production of some of other uh, products, these are obtained as byproducts. Second case is coke, benzene and hydrogen, they are uh, intentionally manufactured or uh, prepared fuels. Then fuels are also classified according to their physical state uh, that is solid fuels, liquid fuels and gaseous fuels. Okay next, <laughs> biofuels. The term biofuel refers to liquid or gaseous fuels for the transport sector that are predominantly produced from biomass. A variety of fuels can be produced from biomass resources, so which include uh, fuels like ethyl alcohol, ethanol, methanol, methyl alcohol, biodiesels produced from various seeds of uh, uh, trees or plants, and gaseous fuels such as hydrogen, methane, like that. So these are the variety of biofuels that can be produced from the biomass. The biomass resource base for biofuel production is composed of variety of forestry and agricultural resources. So this biomass may be coming from number one forestry, waste wood mass can be used. Then from the agricultural resources, waste biomass, agricultural waste or industrial processing residues, for example, ethyl alcohol, ethanol is produced from the molasses. Molasses is a waste byproduct during the manufacturing of sugar. In the production of sugar, after, after the sugar is separated from the uh, scrap or waste, that waste coming out is molasses. So from that molasses, we can produce ethanol. Like this, so one is either from the forestry biomass or from the agricultural waste or from the industrial processing residue. And uh, most uh, another one is municipal solid and urban wood residues, municipal waste, whatever the waste collected. Nowadays you might be knowing that uh, the kitchen waste and other waste from the uh, domestic waste, we say that households is collected. So that we actually give it by segregating. So you know that you know that uh, that we are giving the uh, waste by separating bio waste and non bio. That you know. Huh? So this bio waste, so which can be converted into fuel. 
that is municipal solid waste urban solid waste can be utilized in the production of biofuels so then here renewable source of energy these biofuels are renewable sources of energy because biomass is uh, generated or it is produced regularly continuously uh, then uh, every year or season it is harvested so it is uh, renewable and stored in the form of complex organic compounds such as carbon hydrogen oxygen and nitrogen all these biofuels are stored so in the form of fuel majority again is carbon and hydrogen some part of oxygen and nitrogen will be there so it is a source of 5f source of 5f means food powder fuel fiber and fertilizer then it can be converted into useful forms of energy through different conversion routes there are different processes that we will discuss later hmm. then gets converted into fossil fuels after several millions years under certain conditions of pressure temperature air etc that means whatever these uh, plants and animals deposited millions of years ago underneath the earth or underneath the oceans or sea converted into fossil fuels after several millions of years under certain conditions of pressure and temperature air supply the fossil fuels are not renewable hence are not biomass so that you we should uh, keep in mind even though the fossil fuels what we are using maybe petrol or diesel or uh, kerosene or even the coal also one day it was again biomass billions of years ago then it was collected deposited underneath the earth or ocean and due to that pressure conditions and temperatures and lack of air it converted itself in the long process of millions of years into crude oil or coal whatever is available now so therefore this even though sources from the biomass only we cannot treat fossil fuel as renewable because it cannot be renewed so these points you should keep in mind so again these biofuels can be categorized into first generation biofuels and second generation biofuels the first generation biofuels are made from sugar starch vegetable oils or animal fats using conventional technology the basic feed stock for the production of first generation biofuels come from agriculture and food processing the most common first generation biofuels are biodiesel bioethanol bio oils bio gas these come under first generation biofuels for example biodiesel extraction with or without esterification of vegetable oils from seeds of plants like soya bean palm oil oil seed rape seed sunflower or residues including animal fats derived from uh, rendering applied as uh, fuel in diesel engine so we know that these seeds even including groundnut seed or uh, soya bean seed all these seeds contains fat so when we extract the oil from that seed it is called fatty oil so that fatty oil can be used effectively as fuel but when we when these oils are processed through a process called esterification so these fatty oils or fatty acids are converted into esters you know when chemistry was studied you know the difference between fatty acid and ester so these fatty acids fats are converted into ester so in order to improve the quality of the fuel because these fatty oils 
will have higher viscosity. Viscosity is high means they cannot be effectively used in the transport vehicles because it poses some uh, opposition for combustion. That means the combustion quality is poor. Poor combustion will be there. Then uh, the production of more carbon monoxide, as I told you, loss of energy and some other uh, issues will be there. So in order to overcome all those drawbacks, what is done is these oils which contain fatty acids are transformed into ethers by a process called transesterification. They are converted into esters, thereby reduce the viscosity of these oils and after becoming esters, these fuels are called biodiesels. So the properties, why they are called biodiesels is the properties of these esters will be almost similar to the diesel fuel, to petroleum diesel, and therefore they can be used. These ester fuels can be effectively used in any diesel engine without any modification in the engine itself. Therefore, these esters are called biodiesels. Then next is bioethanol. Ethanol, you know, ethyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol can be produced in different ways. Number one, fermentation of simple sugars from sugar crops like sugar cane or from starch crops like maize or wheat as fuel in petrol engine. So bioethanols, ethanol produced from the biomass. So the, it is produced through a process called fermentation. After fermentation, the sugars or the starch. Again, sugars or starch nothing but uh, carbohydrates. Carbohydrates nothing but hydrocarbons. After uh, the process of fermentation, leads to the formation of alcohol, especially ethanol. So this ethanol, bioethanol, can be effectively used in petrol engine. So because the property of this fuel means ethanol is almost similar to petrol or gasoline. Therefore, these fuels can be used in place of petrol or gasoline in petrol engines. Biodiesels can be effectively used in diesel engines because the properties are similar to diesel. Bioethanol is used in petrol engine because the properties are similar to petrol. Then some bio oil thermochemical conversion of biomass can be done and that oils obtained can also be again used as fuels. Then biogas, you know biogas, it is a gaseous fuel mainly contains methane, CH4, methane. Then anaerobic fermentation or organic waste, animal manures, crop residues, energy crops applied as a fuel in engines suitable for compressed natural gas. So here you know that biogas is a gas, nothing but methane can be obtained or produced by anaerobic means the process or reaction in the absence of air anaerobic fermentation of animal waste or plant waste, maybe cow dung or any waste from human also. So that can be used or any crop residue, biomass can also be used in the production of gas. The gas produced is methane. So that gas is biogas because produced from the biomass that can also be effectively used as a fuel in the engines. It can replace uh, petrol also. It can be used in uh, petrol engine by uh, making some small changes for the supply of the fuel. So, and also this can be used in place of CNG. You know CNG, nowadays it is becoming popular that CNG stands for compressed natural gas. It consists of uh, methane. Mm -hmm. Again, this biogas also contains same methane, CH4, and uh, so that gas after compression can
can also be called as CBG. We popularly call that as compressed biogas. And here it is naturally available methane compressed natural gas CNG. This biogas compressed is CBG, compressed biogas, can also be effectively used in the petrol engines after some modification in the fuel supply system. So these biofuels, first generation biofuels are number one biodiesels, number two bioethanol, number three bio oils, number four biogas. So these are the first generation biofuels. Okay, the next category of biofuels is uh, second generation biofuels. So now in the recent uh, past we are developing some new technologies wherein we can to produce uh, biofuels from the feedstocks so which includes uh, lignocellulose biomass uh, like uh, crop residues or even from the wood directly so we can extract the oils and uh, prepare the fuels so they come under second generation uh, biofuels so there are two transformative technologies are being uh, developed not yet completely finalized but uh, we are in the stage of uh, developing the technologies now the available technology the efficiency of conversion of the wood stock into biofuels is very very less and uh, we are trying some uh, methods uh, wherein we can completely uh, convert the available mass biomass into so fuel so there are two basically techni techniques so one is biochemical and the second one is thermochemical so biochemical is modification of the bioethanol fermentation process including a pre-treatment procedure. Then uh, the thermochemical one is modification of the bio oil process to produce uh, sine gas and methanol, methanol, demethyl, ether. So these are the two fuels that can be produced. So if this technology is properly developed, finally efficient technology is developed, then we can convert even the cellulose, means the wood mass directly into the fuel that will be very effective. So otherwise now what we are doing is from this wood mass we are preparing producer gases. In the, there are some techniques available, technology available. So in the form of uh, gasifiers wherein we can directly convert wood mass into biogases which is called uh, producer gas. Then uh, if we come to the emission of biofuels because in when we are using a fuel in any engine or any furnace the main problem is the emission because so there will be liberation of some toxic gases like carbon monoxide, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides like that which are highly toxic. Hmm. So these biodiesels play a vital role in the inducing emissions of many air pollutants. You cannot say many, early 3-4 are there that is the emission of carbon monoxide, sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides. So is less in case of biofuels compared to petroleum uh, fuels that is eco-friendly you can say the biofuels are eco-friendly then one more advantage is here it is a cycle whatever the carbon dioxide is released carbon dioxide released after combustion of the biofuel enters into the atmosphere the same co2 is absorbed by the plants and after photosynthesis again they produces the uh, they grow, they produce the biomass and by using that biomass again we can produce the biofuels and then again use so the cycle will be completed. So there is no question of extra addition of CO2. So that is the advantage of biofuels. The CO2 liberated undergoes a cycle, CO2 again back to the biomass then in the engine or in the furnace combustion release CO2 and energy then CO2 again absorbed by the plants. So this cycle completes, therefore it is very much advantageous to use biofuels. 
then again there are few disadvantages or drawbacks of using biofuels they are number one a dispersed and land intensive source they spread over and then requires lot of land area for growing that then low energy density the density means the intensity means the amount of energy stored per unit mass of the biomass is very less uh, that is the main drawback of this biomass so could contribute a great deal to global warming and uh, particulate pollution if directly burned okay if we directly burn the biomass instead if we convert it into biofuels like ethanol biodiesel then okay otherwise if we directly burn the biomass then it leads to the addition of particulate matter we say pm particulate matter means after combustion then the soot particles of carbon will be suspended then ash will be suspended in the air and uh, leads to air pollution then these particles again when sit on the plants means the leaves of the plants then leads to reduced photosynthesis reduced yield of the crop so many other additional problems will be there again uh, there will be global warming so this global warming potential so uh, is also high therefore it's, it is a big drawback if we use directly the biomass still an expensive source both in terms of producing the biomass and converting it to alcohols it is expensive because we require land area then time for growing that manpower everything and uh, it is expensive on a small scale there is most likely a net loss of energy mm, because energy spent on that is almost equal to or even more than energy produced after using that so therefore if it is in a small scale it is waste then if you are using it in mass a large scale then of course it is advantageous but uh, basically using the biofuels so it is an advantage because whatever the co2 released after combustion will be recycled that is the main advantage of using biofuels next we will see the requirements of a good fuel so if we want to use any substance as a fuel then it should possess some important uh, qualities or requirements so the required properties are number 1 it should have a low ignition temperature it should not be like 1000 uh, or 500 600 like that so its ignition temperature ignition temperature means the temperature at which the fuel catches fire and burns so that is called ignition temperature so the fuel if we want to use a substance as a fuel it should have low ignition temperature then it should have high calorific value i told you what is calorific value it is the amount of uh, or quantity of heat released after complete combustion of unit mass or unit volume of the fuel that should be very high means energy density stored in the fuel should be high then it should freely burn with high combustion efficiency so its combustion quality should be high so it should burn easily it should undergo combustion easily to release the required energy and uh, complete combustion should take place otherwise so incomplete combustion again leads to the so formation of or liberation of toxic gases number 1 then loss of energy because the time available for combustion will be very less if you consider an engine if we are using a fuel in a engine the time available for complete combustion is in terms of milliseconds we consider uh, the engine running at say 1000 rpm so means uh, it should the complete combustion should take place within fraction of second 0.5 or 0.4 second like that so the fuel if you want to use should undergo combustion easily and uh, within a short span of time then it should not produce harmful gases or smoke no, it should be non polluting or as far as possible should be less polluting then it must produce less ash so ash 
content should be less mm -hmm. so it must be cheaper and should be available easily then its storage must be easy easy to store and easy to handle and transportation should be easy so it should not reach with uh, material of furnace it should not react with the material of the furnace if it is a solid fuel used in the furnace furnace is one wherein the fuel especially solid fuel is taken and uh, burnt to heat the water then prepare the uh, steam in the boilers then that steam is used for generation of power in the thermal power plants and all that but this furnace is the one in which the fuel undergoes combustion then it should not react with the material of the furnace furnace usually made up of number one uh, layers of uh, Oh, what do you call that? Uh, so layers of bricks, uh, refractory bricks, which are used, which are, uh, which can withstand high temperature of the furnace, but the fuel used should not react with that materials of the furnace by which it is made, and uh, it, then it leads to issues. So these are some. Okay, now we will see. The various uh, non conventional sources of energy and uh, their conventions. First, we will take uh, solar energy. So, that is direct solar energy. See, you now you can see here out of the total solar radiation received on the planet Earth, if it is 100%, then hardly 24% of that radiation is directly transmitted or transferred onto the Earth's surface. Rest will be scattered, deviated, reflected, diffracted, and it loses its intensity. Hmm? That means out of 100%, hardly 24% of the energy reaches the surface in the form of beam radiation, direct beam radiation. See, now, uh, the, the in this uh, atmosphere, so we have clouds, then dust particles suspended, and other uh, particles suspended, then uh, the buildings, uh, skyscrapers, all those things, they scatter the radiation and then uh, loses the intensity. Okay, so now we know that uh, sun, it is a sphere of intensely hot gaseous matter and due to the thermonuclear fusion reaction taking place, a lot of heat is generated and uh, that uh, radiate energy is of the, of the order of 4 into 10 raised to 26 watts. So much of uh, heat energy is released from the sun. Mm -hmm. So next is that solar energy is the most readily available source of energy that we know. The sun constantly delivers around 1.36 kilowatts of energy per square meter to the earth. Means if we consider a flat plate of one square meter, one meter by one meter square flat plate, which is held perpendicular to the solar radiation, then approximately 1.36 kilowatts of power is received on that plate. So that is the intensity of solar radiation received onto this earth surface. The energy which reaches the earth surface contains both beam radiation and diffused or dispersed radiation. Okay. The radiation reaches the ground directly from the sun is called beam radiation without any diffraction, reflection, no scattering. So that direct solar radiation received on the earth surface is called beam radiation. Diffuse radiation is that solar radiation received from the sun after its direction is changed by either reflection and scattering by the atmospheric matter. Atmospheric matter, matter includes the clouds, the suspended particles in the atmospheric air and other some buildings and all those things. Mm -hmm. So the solar radiation is not constant. It keeps on changing every minute our day of the month and year so as i told you earlier this uh, is not constant 
the solar radiation received is not constant and 1.36 kilowatt is the average. Uh, so then uh, at the early morning it is less and as uh, the time passes at the midday it is highest and then again goes on reducing in the evening it is less and in the night no radiation received. Okay. So then uh, there is therefore it is difficult to design a solar device which will suit to our requirements. So to harvest solar energy we need solar collectors. Collectors are the receivers which receive the radiation, solar radiation. These collectors are designed to absorb and store the solar energy. These devices should work more effectively in varying temperature conditions. That is very important. We will see the term we use when we talk about solar energy. This constant, solar constant is very important. Solar constant is a measure of solar electromagnetic radiation per unit area that would be incident on a plane perpendicular to the rays at a distance of one astronomical unit from the sun, roughly the mean distance from the sun to the earth. So that is, so we can say the energy received per square meter, so that is approximately 1.362 kilowatt per meter square. This is the approximate amount of energy received on a solar collector or a plate held perpendicular to the solar radiation. So it is 1.362 at maximum it is. Hmm, not average, it is the maximum. Okay. So now So radiant solar energy falling onto the earth can be converted into thermal energy using collectors. So there are two types of collectors, flat blade collectors and focusing collectors. We will see one by one. So here you might have seen these type of flat blade collectors. So in the domestic applications for solar water heaters, we use this type of uh, domestic solar water heaters. So now if we take uh, solar energy harvesting, the most commonly used household is liquid flat plate collectors. Hmm? Flat plate collector is a device used to absorb and store solar energy. So it is called flat plate because there will be a flat plate. Hmm? Then the pipelines will run above that and then it is covered by using a glass or uh, usually glass plate. Okay. Solar radiation incident on this will pass through this and uh, heats the water available in these pipelines. Okay. So this water is made to flow to and from a tank, overhead tank. Now if you consider this as a overhead tank, cold water is supplied to the tank from the bottom hot water is taken out, tapped out from the top. So now what happens is when cold water it flows into the collector, it passes through various uh, number of tubes while passing, so it is getting heated up by the solar radiation received. So onto this. Then it's get heated up and uh, it moves up as the temperature increases, the fluid becomes light water becomes light in weight and then moves up, moves up and then it is collected at the top in the tank. So then cold water flows in this again, it continues. So this is uh, the thermosiphon hot water system. So this movement of water from bottom to the top takes place due to the thermosiphon effect. That is when the water is cold, it moves at the bottom and after getting heated up, it moves up because of its lightness compared to the cold water. So that effect is called thermosiphon effect and this type of solar water heaters are called thermosiphon hot water systems. Okay, so then this glass is again designed with the material which are selective surfaces, you see. Selective surfaces means 
whatever the solar radiation coming here it passes through this glass plate and after striking the inner tubes or inner flat plate that solar radiation will be converted into heat radiation and after converting into heat radiation there will be change in the wavelength of those radiations solar radiation wavelength is different and after passing through this after heating this the wavelength of the radiation changes and the material used for this glass is such a selective material that it allows the solar radiation from out to inside but once the radiation becomes heat radiation and wavelength changes it will not allow this radiation to go out that means it tries to retain the heat inside itself so thereby efficiency of the collector will be increased so such materials are called selective surfaces or selective materials used in the flat plate collectors so here uh, once uh, this is how uh, the flat plate collector works so so this is what i explained here the flat plate collector efficiency is good at a medium and maximum temperature okay but uh, uh, at low temperature the efficiency is very very low flat plate collectors are designed for output temperatures ranging from 60 to 100 that is these are the main application is for the domestic bathing and all that so uh, the temperature range is 60 to 100 Uh, degree celsius this is the temperature range at which these flat plate collectors are working next second category is parabolic collectors parabolic collectors means here whatever the solar radiation beam radiation falling on this it is uh, this collector is a curved and this curve is almost like a parabola that's why these collectors are called parabolic collectors so whatever the radiation falling on this curved surface is made to reflect on the pipeline which passes through this line so this line is nothing but the uh, located on the point of focus point of focus that means all the radiation falling on this curved surface getting reflected onto this line a uh, line of focus so thereby the entire heat is concentrated these are also called concentrated collectors so then the temperature achieved here in this case of concentrating collectors is very high we can reach temperature of the order of 400 to 500 degrees celsius so such high temperature can be achieved by using this type of concentrating collectors again in this concentrating collectors there are two types one is parabolic collectors so wherein the pipeline passes through or in line with the uh, line of focus of this parabola the other one is dish type so this type wherein so the collector will be almost like a dish and the entire solar radiation falling on the disk is focused back onto the point and there even we can achieve highest temperature okay then here when the temperature achieved is of the order of 400 or 500 degree celsius so we cannot use water here we use some of the oils so which we call as thermal oils which can withstand high temperatures of the order of 500 600 degrees celsius so then this oil flowing here gets heated up heated up and reaches 400 or 500 degrees celsius because of the concentrated uh, focusing so then comes out here so then this so here what happens is <coughs> this high temperature oil exchanges the heat with the, the water so when the oil is at around 400 500 degrees celsius it exchanges the heat with the water then that water gets converted into steam high temperature high pressure steam and then uh, that steam is made to flow into the turbine 
it is a steam turbine turbine is a machine which converts uh, the heat energy of the steam into mechanical work or rotation the steam energy means high temperature high pressure steam when passes over the blades of the turbine there will be turbine with number of blades and when it passes through the turbine blades then energy is transferred from the high pressure high temperature steam to the blades of the road uh, turbine and then turbine rotates and then this turbine rotated is coupled with a generator uh, the shaft this is the shaft which connects the turbine with the generator and when the shaft rotates generator shaft rotates so then this rotation is converted into electricity in this generator so this is the arrangement wherein the solar energy is collected and used to generate electricity these are called solar thermal power plants these are called solar thermal power plants thermal power plant because here steam is generated by using the temperature and that steam at high temperature and pressure is made to rotate the turbine and then this turbine connected to the generator runs the generator thereby producing or generating the electricity so this type of arrangement in a power plant is called solar thermal power plant so next another method of converting the solar energy into electricity is by using a photovoltaic cells so here a photovoltaic cell also called as solar cell is a device that converts the solar radiation into electrical energy so you might have seen uh, the solar street lamps or solar panels uh, at the, uh, your uh, places so here this is a simple diagram which explains the solar voltaic cell okay so it consists of two layers photovoltaic cell is made up of uh, at least two layers of semiconductor materials like silicon okay so you know what is semiconductor mm -hmm. so the first layer has a positive charge or p type uh, semiconductor then the second layer is having a negative charge or n type semiconductor so if you observe this diagram here so this is a uh, top one is a p type semiconductor and the bottom one sorry top one is the n type semiconductor and bottom one is the p type semiconductor and it is separated by a depletion layer okay so it is not non conducting depletion labor so this substrate base is nothing but a base material to support this uh, at the top and bottom there will be base substrate which support these materials uh, supporting material it is the role is just to physically support this mm -hmm. then when the solar radiation falls on this uh, plate which is negative or n type semiconductor so the electrons in this gets uh, energized they absorb the photon and energy available in the photons light is consisting of small packet of energy called photons that you have studied so this energy available in the photons will be absorbed by the electrons in the n type semiconductor then when they absorb they get energized and then they leave the orbital and jump okay come out of the orbital so that's what they are saying when the light strikes the photoic voltaic cells the semiconductor material absorbs photons from the light mm -hmm. when enough photons are absorbed by the negative layer of the semiconductor electrons are dislodged from the material which when move towards the positive layer this flow of electrons constitutes electric current so for that we are building a circuit so at the top layer when the solar radiation received so it absorbs the electrons absorb the energy from the photons it energizes and uh, moves out and reaches the p type semiconductors 
so here we establish a current so this current is nothing but electric current or electricity so used in domestic so this is used in domestic lighting purpose street lighting purpose railway signals and all this you have seen at your places this type of so photovoltaic uh, cells usually one cell cannot work there will be number of cells connected to make a panel what you have seen is a panel consisting of many number of this type of cells to achieve the required voltage and current because if you consider only one cell the voltage achieved and the current obtained is very very minimum and with that minimum we cannot glow a light is not possible okay so for our energy requirement uh, purpose of energy so we will make a collective effort this hundreds of this type of cells are made into one panel the panel board so it consists of hundreds of this type of cells so thereby we can achieve the required voltage and the required current so this type of arrangement wherein the direct solar energy coming and uh, uh, falling on the surface of a n type semiconductor is absorbed by the uh, semiconductor electrons then pass through reach the p type semiconductor thereby establishing a current thereby establishing an electricity and achieving the required voltage and uh, current density by making arrangement of panels of these type of cells is a photovoltaic uh, cell and the devices are photovoltaic devices so examples are uh, domestic lighting street lighting uh, railway signals and other places we can find the application of these things and next another technology which is used to store large amount of solar energy is a solar pond so the solar pond works on a very simple principle principle is a very simple so we know that uh, even i told you earlier in the previous slides that water when uh, water any other fluid or air also when it's get heated up becomes lighter and moves up and the cold fluid will flow down that is general principle similarly if for any ordinary pond also when there is solar radiation it heats the water at the top and the heated water from within the pond rises and reaches the top but loses the heat into the atmosphere because the air which is flowing over the pond regularly so that will carry out the heat from the surface of the pond so then ultimately the net result is that the pond water remains at the atmospheric temperature same remains same temperature even though the pond is exposed to solar radiation throughout the day there will not be any temperature change and there, there will not be any heat retention because it is exposed to the atmosphere air and air carries the heat away from that and then it remains at the same temperature so solar pond restricts this tendency by dissolving salt in the bottom layer of the pond making it too heavy to rise so here what is done is instead of normal water so for this pond we use the water which is salted and it is heavy which is heavy so in the next diagram we will understand what is that so a solar pond is a pool of water in which a salt concentration gradient a water density gradient and hence a temperature gradient can be maintained to collect the solar thermal energy so if you observe this diagram so this consists of this is a pond consisting of three different zones mm -hmm. so to be frank a solar pond is a artificially created pond over large area by adding salt sodium chloride or magnesium chloride at the bottom of the pond see at the bottom so at the lower zone salt is added either magnesium chloride or sodium chloride salt is added so which is, this zone is lower zone of water 
is also called as the storage zone which is rich in salt uh, and it is a area where solar radiation is absorbed and stored this is the storage zone the upper zone of water called surface zone this is the upper convective zone which is called uh, surface zone so it is cold and has very low salt content the salt content is very less uh, so then it is exposed to the atmosphere and remains at a low temperature the intermediate zone separates the upper and uh, lower zone this is the intermediate zone which separates the upper uh, zone and the uh, lower zones okay so as solar radiation is, is absorbed hot water in the storage zone cannot rise due to the high salt content in it so this is intentionally made high salt uh, zone so because of that salt content this becomes heavy and when the solar radiation falls on this it is transferred to the bottom zone through this gradient zone gradient is because there exists a temperature gradient between the two layers this zone is low temperature this is high temperature and this gradient this line indicates the temperature gradient from low to high okay then here temperature remains same here the temperature remains same constant temperature at the top layer constant temperature at the bottom layer and in between you see the slope this slope indicates there is a gradient temperature difference between the two layers okay so gradient zone here it is transparent insulating salt gradient this is also insulating salt gradient mm -hmm. so it insulating means it avoids the flow of heat from this to this layer okay that's very important one point is here this becomes heavy because of the salt content and it cannot rise even though it, the temperature is high it cannot rise and that maintained at the bottom and the heat is stored here on the other hand the intermediate zone acts as an insulator thermal insulator and will avoid the transfer of heat from this zone bottom zone to the upper zone so if this layer is not there then because of the temperature gradient a difference in temperature heat flows from this point of high temperature to this point of low temperature and again loss of heat there is no flow of mass water remains same here but heat flows and loss of temperature there will loss of heat takes place so in order to avoid that intermediate zone is very very important this is a transparent and insulating zone so made up of material so which avoid or reduces the heat transfer from this zone to this zone that's very important huh? so this is how a solar pond is designed to store the heat energy in the form of heat only this is an example for thermal storage huh? thermal storage of heat energy or solar energy so with this i will conclude the second session of module 1 so thank you